my great grandfather he was the cotton king of his time it was not that i was in for a longer term to come to the market it was like chote se time mein thoda paisa bana lete hmm. investing karke aur fir apna business start karenge and their caliber in fact gave me more motivation that the kind of work we are doing is not being done by bigger institutions but when the ipo happened a lot of funds were not interested in cdsl because the market cap was so small in fact for 6 to 8 months cdsl underperformed hi arvind sir how are you doing hi sanjana i am fine sir first of all uh, thank you so much for coming here all the way surat se aap bombay aaye hain at the headquarters of upsurge feels really good to have you here and uh, we've been witnessing ki nivesha ka kaisa growth raha hai in the past 3 4 years and you have just launched one another small case this diwali so i'm pretty sure ki wo bhi future mein waise hi performance dega so sir how did you start your journey of investing aapne nivesha kaise start kiya aur aapka pura background timeline ke sath aap ek bar bataiye so uh, it is a very interesting journey i i became a accidental kind of kind of an investor because i knew nothing about the stock markets uh, no, none of my uh, family or anyone was uh, into stock markets in fact everyone was negative about stock markets so i had negative you know motivation to come to the markets but i i remember one of my friend he used to trade stocks way, way back when he was in 11th grade and i was uh, you know uh, with him uh, uh, so i st- caught that fascination that you could make a lot of money by trading stocks and uh it is it is I, i guess at an age of 16 when i first got interest into trading in the markets it was not an investment kind of an approach but it was more of a trading kind of an approach but what really over the years uh, you know built into my mindset that i wanted to become a good investor were a couple of things that i was wanting to solve always one is that one of uh, a family uh, you can say uh, background that i if, if i give you my my great grandfather he was the cotton king of his times okay. so way back he used to export cotton to russia and he was the person who used to sometimes wo bolte na mandi mein bhav nikalna ke aaj subah kitne rupaye mein cotton trade hoega there used to be a, a crowd of 200 people near our house every morning oh. and he used to you know open the prices for cotton at that day right so jaisalmer mein jahan pe uh, oh. you know uh, my native is there uh, when <coughs> independence uh, you know happened in our country and the prime minister of our country moved across to collect you know money for uh, nation building hmm. and when he w- went to the raja of rajasthan that you know i want money for nation building you also contribute he took uh, you know uh, the, the 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 prime minister of india to few houses yeah. and one of the house was ours so we oh. have a photograph of my great grandfather giving donation at that point of time sone ki theli bolte the us samay unko dete hue ki for nation building this is my contribution in fact he was the person who owned first of the 10 cars in india and things like that and all that background got washed away in two generations oh. so my grandfather and my father's generation couldn't sustain that immense wealth very, very that was created by my great grandfather so i and and whenever and we used to visit to our native often so whenever i was asked that question Uh, or or stories were being narrated about all these things i used to wonder that why the wealth did not sustain hmm. and you know when i i i i started you know when i joined Ch- chartered accountantship and and in 11 12 when economics as a as a subject was there i used to think about markets and economy on the whole okay. and also okay. try to relate it with how businesses over the long term have survived or wealth over the long term have survived with a lot of families right. and they did not survive in our family in fact my great grandfather was you know also related to or friends with the birla family at that point of time oh. so if we would have invested in th- those shares yeah. at that point of time then the wealth would have sustained or if we would have started a company the wealth would, would have sustained so it was always in my mind that a i also want to become a businessman like my great grandfather and i did not have a starting capital to that because all of that got washed away in a couple of generation and b how that can be sustainable okay. so investing was the only route that i could find out For that which i could yeah. start with a small capital and experience entrepreneurship and also you know try to build my capital and then start some business of my own got so it. it was not that i was in for a longer term mm-hmm. to come to the markets it was like 
छोटे से टाइम में थोड़ा पैसा बना लेते हैं इन्वेस्टिंग करके और फिर अपना बिजनेस स्टार्ट करेंगे दैट वॉज अ होल माइंड सेट विद विच आई केम टू द मार्केट्स बट देन एज एंड वेन गुड पीपल स्टार्ट इट ज्वाइन वेन वेन वी आई आई स्टिल रिमेंबर वी हैड अ वेरी स्मॉल टीम सो आई वॉज इन इंडस्ट्री रिसर्च इन बॉम्बे आई मूव बैक टू सूरत एंड आई स्टार्ट विद जस्ट थ्री पार्ट टाइम स्टूडेंट्स हु माई वॉज टीचिंग ऑल्सो सी एन सी एफ ए एंड दे इन फैक्ट बिकेम द फर्स्ट रिसर्च एनालिस्ट एंड एंड धेर कैलिबर इन फैक्ट गिव मी मोर मोटिवेशन दैट द काइंड ऑफ वर्क वी आर डूइंग इज नॉट बींग डन बाई बिगर इंस्टीट्यूशन एंड विच इज वॉट द इन्वेस्टर वॉन्ट्स सो देर वॉज अ बिग गैप बिटवीन वॉट uh institutions were doing or or wealth management firms were doing which we, which was that they were having an army of sales people yeah. trying to sell products across to the public and to the investment community at the large and the research team was centralized which had no communication with the investors so we thought that it was a big gap yeah. that we could solve if if the research can directly be given to the retail public and to the you know investing public so that was the thought process that we thought we should try we struggled for a couple of years but then yes it eventually uh, came up uh, very well over the years and and we have a growing team and a growing investor base now wow very interesting story in fact numbers were probably always in your uh, family generation yeah. right yeah. so you are good with numbers that yeah. explains yeah. so what was the first stock that you chose and what was your rationale behind actually <laughs> investing in that stock so as i told you i started as a trader so it was not that i a particular stock i don't even remember before because a lot of stocks uh, you know just you just bought and traded and sold so it was not a serious investing but yeah uh, the first serious investing that i did actually 2006 when i started and the market was uh, you know in a bull run of its own and a lot of money got made and it got lost in 2008 also and i got depressed and you know i thought that markets you know are are are, are such a uh, such a animal that they take away so much that they give but i the first portfolio that i uh, you know put around it was a three stock portfolio in 2009 uh which i just bought it and i thought that i'll just put this money and just forget it uh those three stocks in fact were uh, one of the company is actually garvare waldos which used to make okay. these uh, fishing nets and uh, net for sports and all these uh, specialty applications other company was a company called rain industries which uh, uh, used to make cement and it was a leading player of calcine pet coke at that point of time so mm-hmm. i got interested in ideas and and through my learning from ca and economics which which i i as a sub that i enjoyed a lot uh, i i understood one thing and as a student also when i used to learn a lot of things and 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 as a journey of you know trying to uh, also seek what my great grandfather did that made him so successful so what i learned when uh, from the uh, you know uh, 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 family history that he used to buy things when they were close to you know no one betting on them okay so people used to tell about him that यू नो मिट्टी में भी हाथ डालते थे तो सोना निकाल देते थे दैट काइंड ऑफ यू नो थिंग्स आई आई हर्ड अबाउट हिम सो दैट मीन्स दैट यू हैव टू बाय थिंग्स व्हेन नो वन इज बेटिंग अराउंड ए दैट इज योर एडवांटेज एंड बी ही ही यूज टू यू नो ऑलवेज बी देयर वेयर ही कुड डोमिनेट राइट सो जैसे कॉटन का भाव वो निकालते थे सो ही यूज टू डोमिनेट द कॉटन ट्रेड सो दीज वर द टू थिंग्स दैट आई आई काइंड ऑफ फ्रॉम माई फैमिली ट्रेडिशन ऑल्सो अंडरस्टोर दैट यू हैव टू बी इन बिजनेसिस विच यू कैन actually those people are dominating or buy them at a price or when people are not betting it is so these were the two things that were hmm. at the back of the mind uh, not from any learnings from any book or you know because as i told you i was not from a financial background or any one from the family who was in uh, you know in markets but the business background hmm. that hmm. had uh, uh, used to give me that motivation and that's why these were these differentiated businesses that i thought i should buy yeah and uh, you know they didn't do well initially mm. but yeah eventually uh, most of them uh, had this differentiated nature of them g- gave them a lot of uh, cash flows and in in 4 5 years that portfolio did actually very well and that gave me more motivation to become a long term investor right. and that right. changed my course and i started thinking about that can i replicate this thought process even more and in variety of businesses and try to you know uh, increase my horizon of understanding uh, different types of businesses so yeah that 2009 portfolio i i guess was the turning point 
Nice. So, sir, you mentioned about bull runs, right? A uh, very interesting point that you know, ज़्यादा तर लोग bull run में enter करते हैं market में. Correct. पर अभी इतने सारे bear runs हुए हैं, जैसे 2018 में था, 2020 में था. Correct. So, आप वो कैसे tackle करते हो? Correct. So, it is. Uh, it was very difficult early on because as I told you 2008 all, a lot of dreams got shattered yeah. when I experienced that but over the years what has happened is and what I've realized is that it's a cycle which keeps repeating again and again mm. and because the kind of companies that I like buying these are uh, niche businesses uh, having you know lower market cap and hence they go down faster than the market uh, if the market is around 20 I might be down 30, 35, 40 whatever. Mm. So the kind of hit that I used to take in my portfolio was even, even you know, greater. So it's more like that it, it, you know, you have bear markets mein portfolio drawdowns dekh liye hai, that now it doesn't affect that much okay. because you're more prepared for it that yeah. year. To, it's, it's a cycle which will keep repeating itself and you cannot avoid it because I don't like keeping a lot of cash. So if you're fully invested and if a bear market comes, you'll be hit very hard. Right. But then that's the way, the nature of the beast. So, what I've, I've seen is that over the years, a uh, bear market give you exceptional opportunities hmm. to invest for the longer term. So 2009, the portfolio that I made did exceptionally well. Okay. So these portfolios, I'm not saying that you should always invest in bear market. But what I'm saying is the prices advantage that you get in a bear market is like everything is at sale. Hmm. Then, hmm. Uh, you know, if you make uh, a few good decisions, you'll do exceptionally well. In a bull market, hmm. Uh, the prices get taken to an astronomical levels which everyone feels happy about but it is a party which you have to be you know very vigilant about and you have to take care that you make the most of it but at the same time you know plan your exit but yeah the experience has been that uh, investing in both the market is a bit different people are either a good bull market investor or are either a good bear market investor mm. but if you could mix both of them a uh, few 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 tricks of the trade you can learn from the bear market investor and few tricks of the trade if you can uh, you know learn from the bear market in, uh, bull market bull investor market invest. that goes very handy because investing in both the kind of the markets is a bit different in a bull market you can uh, you know maybe uh, within weeks get your returns and in a bear market you know uh, years can months can go by years can go by and no returns get made but that excruciating pain the more you experience the more uh, better you become as an investor uh, okay. 2020 was actually a bear market but it lasted very uh, briefly. briefly so that excruciating pain was not there which was there maybe in 2018 to 19 or 2008 to 9 maybe or maybe 12 13 but yeah uh, these bear markets i guess give you exceptional opportunity to put your head down and study the trends which are doing well because no matter what bear market is happening in the whole you know economy there will be sectors which will be outperforming and there will be companies that will be growing. Mm -hmm. Post the dot-com bubble, for example, everyone wrote off the, the technology, technology shares. Mm -hmm. But the 20 years post the crash, Nasdaq was perhaps one of the best hunting grounds for multivaggers. Okay. Right? Amazon, mm -hmm. Facebook, mm -hmm. Google, the all these get right. got created post that crash. Okay. So, because their underlying businesses were doing exceptionally mm -hmm. well. So, my focus is always on where the overall growth is you know getting derived in the economy and if you are with those sectors it doesn't matter whether you're in a bull market or a bear market in a bear market they will maybe not uh, uh, trouble you if the earnings come along so they will fall uh, initially a lot but then they will stabilize and start moving up first and in a bull market these will be the companies which will uh, you know get the maximum amount of flows from the investing world and hence they will outperform the market brilliantly so okay. more focus has to be there on the underlying uh, companies if they are growing or the sectors if are growing well uh, then both hmm. markets uh, will, will favor you yeah. so for my understanding uh, in the bull markets you probably identify the trends and you know which yeah. industries are doing yeah. well yeah. and when a bear market is about to come you probably buy those put put them in a watch list and then probably yeah. buy those stocks yeah so bear market is a time when a lot of good companies so what happens in a bull market that a lot of 
quality companies are not available at a cheaper price right. because everything is going up and the quality companies are going up even faster and the growth companies are just tearing uh, correct, apart correct. but in a bear market you get these companies as ex- exceptional discounts hmm. and that is where you try to buy them more or maybe even try to consider certain companies that you are not buying because of the valuation and now the valuation has become very cheap and hence you try for example i'll just give you an example that and it's just not about bear markets it's about individual events in companies sometimes you know uh, uh, give you those kind of opportunities right. so it is across many years if you've been in the markets you'd realize that if in in 2011 or 12 i don't remember exactly the year but there was a raid on pt light industries hmm. and that income tax raid if someone could have understood the tax liability could have been you know whatever one or two x of the annual profits but the brand pt light hmm. was here to you know be there for 30 40 50 years more correct, maybe correct. that the income tax department cannot take away right so that that crash gave you an opportunity to buy pedelite and, mm-hmm. and I, at one point of time i put almost 40% of my net worth in pedelite at oh. that point of time so i thought this is an event which will not take away the brand of pedelite right so similarly in bear markets <coughs> uh, for example if demon is uh, you know announced or we, uh, uh, you know any any uh, particular event can give a panic stricken uh you can say reaction from the markets hmm. and those panic stricken reactions are something that you need to look at when you want to buy certain things that you were not buying and you want to uh, you know maybe uh, correct your approach because for example in 2020 everything went down right but we were observing certain trends before the the fall that were happening in the green energy space for example hmm. Hmm. and that fall gave us a brilliant opportunity to buy stocks around the green energy space okay. which were expensive but then the fall made sure that these are available at a very reasonable valuation mm-hmm. and which had long runway because economies of the world were making commit and in covid times people realize that if you if you're slowing down your uh, economy and vehicles are not moving in that uh, uh, you know uh, manner and airlines are not uh, running in in a normal fashion then the pollution levels went down and hence people realize how better you can be yeah. if you can reduce the pollution so that gave a lot of encouragement to a lot of governments and during that period you had a lot of announcement from the eu nations a lot of nations around the world that by 2030 or 35 we want to reduce our emissions by 40% 50% some countries 100% so there were a lot of these kinds of long term tailwinds which were already there which became stronger hmm. and you had a market where the prices were crashing okay so it was a deadly combination where the multi bagger returns are getting created okay. right so if you get a bear market where you can buy sectors or companies which have these kind of tailwinds and the valuation comes at a reasonable value uh, level that is where a lot of return is made i guess agar aap ye video dekh rahe ho to aap zarur kisi company ko padhna aur samajhna chahte honge aur agar ye baat sach hai to mere paas aapke liye ek good news hai at up search humne ek course banaya hai which is a complete course on fundamental analysis जहाँ पे हम काफ़ी सारी इन डेप्थ टॉपिक्स डिस्कस करते हैं जैसे फिनेंशियल स्टेटमेंट्स को कैसे पढ़ा जाए वैल्यूएशन एनालिसिस क्या होता है और मल्टी बैग स्टॉक्स को कैसे पिक कर सकते हैं ये कोर्स हमने क्यूरेट किया है नमस्कार प्रसाद के साथ जिनके YouTube पर 20 लाख से भी ज़्यादा सब्सक्राइबर्स है और उनके वीडियोज़ ऑन फंडामेंटल एनालिसिस बहुत ही ज़्यादा फेमस है तो वीडियो पर वापस जाने से पहले जो लिंक डिस्क्रिप्शन में है उसे चेक जरूर कीजिएगा एंड डू इनरोल फॉर दिस कोर्स तो सर वी ऑल्सो सो यो पिक्चर विद राधा किशन दमानी एंड आई थिंक मोनिश एंड सम अदर इन्वेस्टर्स एज वेल सो जस्ट वॉन्ट टू आस्क वेन टू अस्ट्यूट इन्वेस्टर्स आर मीटिंग वॉट काइंड ऑफ कॉन्वर्जेशन आर ब्रूइंग देयर सो आई डोंट कंसिडर माई सेल्फ एज एन एक्ट्यूट इन्वेस्टर सो यू कैन टेक दैट आउट ऑफ द पिक्चर बट या ऑल दीज बिग इन्वेस्टर्स वॉट आई फाउंड वेरी पिक्यूलियर इंटरक्टिंग विद दैम इज ए दे आर लर्निंग मशीन्स आई मीन uh monish whenever i meet him uh he has a lot of interesting takeaways from around the world okay. because he visits companies from turkey korea uh, uh you know us japan india everywhere so the kind of insight that he throws on a lot of businesses are sometimes not available with us because we are just investing in the indian markets yeah. right secondly uh, investors like uh, you know uh, uh, radha krishna damani or govind ji parekh or you know all all, all these uh, astute investors when i meet them they give a picture of you know concentration that 
how you can just focus on few ideas and that can just completely change your life. Okay. For example, if you look at Govindji Parekh, he has focused initial years just on companies which are based out of, you know, in and around Chennai. Okay. And he's done exceptionally well by knowing the promoters in and out and investing with those companies for 30, 30, 45 years. And he's bought, you know, companies at what, three, 400 crores market cap and they've become, you know, close to 40, 50,000 crores market That's cap sweet. even north yeah. of that. So that's a kind of huge wealth, uh, 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 you know, I have seen uh, uh, being made by a lot of these astute investors because they simplify a lot of these processes mm -hmm. or they are learning machines. They just keep on understanding newer things, um, meeting new people, meeting newer companies, uh, trying to put their head around uh, of, of, on mental models that they can understand uh, a particular sector or a particular company better. And, and Monish, in fact, you know, gave, gives us a lot of learnings about how Charlie thinks oh. and which is one of the best value adds uh, whenever I meet him because uh, Monish has the luxury of meeting, you know, Charlie Munger almost on a monthly basis and he, he, he plays with him and, and, and he has very interesting tales to, to speak about Munger every time when he comes to India and meets us. And I take my team also to meet him and it's a wonderful gesture that Monish always, you know, is ready to accommodate us whenever uh, he's in India. So uh, that four or five hours of discussion with him is like understanding what, how Munger thinks, how he over the years uh, has learned a lot of nuances. He started certain things, uh, uh, you know, when he was 90 years of age. For example, uh, at, a, at his 95th birthday or 96th birthday, uh, you know, Monish was telling me that he, he thought that he, he should uh, learn architecture, for example. And within two years, he was able to design, you know, uh, wow. some, some elementary school designs or even a, a, a you know, houseboat office. So, so these kind of, you can say, learnings uh, 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 are something that I look up to whenever I meet uh, the, these great uh, or brilliant investors, for sure. Uh, that's really interesting, sir. So the next question is, uh, how is your personal portfolio allocation different from the one that you manage for the public? Yeah. And do you probably take more risk in your personal portfolio? Yeah, so I tell this to a lot of my, uh, uh, you, you know, investors as well that I personally, you know, have a larger appetite for risk. Okay. And it is something which comes naturally. No one can train you for taking risk. So I'm a person who can have, uh, you know, a nice uh, night of sleep even when my portfolio is down 60%, right? Which is not the case with other investors. So I am very comfortable uh, concentrating my portfolio, taking, uh, you know, in the initial years, I took a lot of leverage as well and which did not disturb me even, in, even if when in 2008, for example, it went bad. Okay. And even in a brief period of 2012, it went bad. But it never affected me uh, or my family life or my general you can say energy it, it does affect but i thought and and this was true as i've understood in a lot of ways of my life whether i was playing sports or whether i was you know uh, as a student for example right so when i was studying i used to study economics for example seven months oh. right and not study other subject <laughs> right <laughs> during my chartered accountantship you know i wrote i i guess eight nine months just taxation oh. I, I i i just uh, you know studied that which meant that i could fail but yeah. I was okay with that and I did fail my CA final examination, oh, but okay. that was okay with me. Yeah. I didn't feel a regret beyond yeah. that day. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I used to think that, am I doing something bad? Because if I'm not having this <laughs> feeling of regret, then I'll keep on failing my examinations. Right. Right. But the point is that now looking back, that has helped me a lot. Because I could take risks which... For, for, for uh, if, I, if I at that point of time, you know, thought I could have lo lost and in fact at one point of time, I almost lost all my capital and it was very difficult to start again, oh. but I always backed myself and that always gave me uh, that confidence that I can come back. And if that was not there, if any other style of investing I could have chosen, I would not have been that happy as an investor which I am right now yeah. because I like taking risks mm -hmm. and I, I enjoy it when I am right. So I want to make big when I am right. If I have a lesser allocation, then somehow 
it doesn't give me that kind of a joy hmm. that i just put 2% of my portfolio in a bet even if it goes up 5 7 10 x that is not materially right. changing much so that is where since the beginning as an investor i used to think in absolute amounts not as a percentage allocation as all finance books teach us right okay. 8 this percent kar lo 2 percent kar lo 5 percent kar lo i used to think that if this is a company that i like and if i want to make this x amount of capital for example i want to earn 1 crore out of you know this investment of mine and i believe it has a whatever 5 10 x put then how can i in the initial years also put 10 lakhs somehow i can get 10 lakhs somewhere mm. i can beg borrow steal whatever <laughs> take <laughs> loan from my brother mother whatever but i want it 10 lakhs somehow i will do that some some things went right some things went wrong but that approach i think helped me because it was kind of an approach which maybe from the stories of my great grandfather borrowed that you know if if you want to bet you have to dominate right and okay. you have to made it right. make it big so if i did not put that capital maybe you know i would have had a journey where i could have done a 15 20% kind of cagr returns i would have been happy in my life because mm. that is also great but the kind of multiples that i made on my investments was because of that approach okay. and that has given me some positive some negatives but the positive examples have given me a lot of confidence that that approach works for me as a person hmm. because it give, gives me a bigger high the <laughs> loss that i gain by betting heavy hmm. doesn't give me that much pain so it's a win win for it. me right yeah. so so as a person i am a uh, i am a concentrated investor and i like to bet heavily whenever i i find an idea which is good and past 4 5 years i have also tried to put uh, give money to entrepreneurs which i feel in the private markets are doing good so it's just not about the public markets now i think about public private whatever i want to find entrepreneurs who can make it big who have that vision who have that nice. uh, you can say uh, energy and also the execution to do that and whenever i find these combinations right i i i go ahead and bet heavily uh, that is what i like doing and i'll keep on doing that i believe i can sustain that at least for the coming 20 30 years that's quite contrary to what we've learned in behavioral economics <laughs> loss hota hai to zyada dukh hota hai yeah. is what and that yeah. that is what i i want folks around nivesha whenever they join i tell them this thing that if you're very afraid as an investor uh, you will be uncomfortable at nivesha <laughs> because i don't want folks uh, because you you have a culture and you have an environment right yeah. if 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 the culture is that i want to cut the risk and focus on whatever that 10 12 15% kind of cagr returns then that kind of a organization you build we tell this to our investors we tell this to people who join nivesha that we are not kind of people who uh, enjoy that kind i am not saying that's bad i mean compounding for longer years is very good for your uh, you can say overall portfolio but uh, we are more excited about what can happen if i bet big and that multiplier comes rather than whatever losses it can bring and it will always but somehow it averages out i feel Got it. and that's what uh, is the culture that uh, right. i have uh, in a in a way seen which gives us more energy and hence people have joined nivesh i also now uh, kind of are are like <laughs> acquainted that. with yeah. it that's good cool. so uh, sir right now ek data aaya tha kuch ki small and mid cap stocks are by far outperforming large caps so be- because you also concentrate a lot on small and mid cap space mm-hmm. what are you currently looking at which industries do you think are going to you know yeah. further in yeah. this space so that's a very important and a very interesting question and the second part of your question is very important that which industries do we feel yeah. uh, see this categorization of small large and mid is for the market participants to do but our job as an investor i feel is always to focus on what you said the companies and the sectors which should do well right and whether in those sectors you are finding opportunities which can outperform the overall industry and also these entrepreneurs have that kind of energy and execution which can make them market leaders and they can for a very long period of time Correct. being uh, you know uh, associated with high growth and they 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 have that kind of culture in their organization that they continuously find talent which can you know give them high growth rate so our focus is always that if we can identify those kind of entrepreneurs and they should not be uh, discovered so the point is generally large caps are discovered 
Correct. And generally, when a company becomes a large cap, we believe they've already passed their journey of high growth. Hmm. Because they've become large cap because they had high growth in the past, hmm. right? And market has appreciated that and given, given that market right. cap. That is why we generally avoid large caps and we generally are focused more on small caps where we believe there is a lot of, you know, ideas which are undiscovered because of information arbitrage, because of a lot of, uh, you can say, uh, uh, bigger funds who don't want to commit capital in this space uh, because they have mandates that they have a particular market cap of companies that they want to buy. Uh, they, they have focused on a lot of particular types of businesses that they don't want to touch because traditionally those businesses have not done well. For example, defense. For mm. example, you know, in our country, uh, discretionary consumption. These are uh, sectors which have not done that well. Okay. But there will be a time when these sectors will start doing well. Mm. You have to be on ground and trying to identify earlier than the market that when is that turning point. Yeah. And our focus is always there. Mm. That we don't believe in analyzing past performance data and wait for events to fold, unfold and then try to invest. We always try to A, first definitely be on ground and try to gather a lot of data about a lot of high growth sectors, about a lot of sectors which have not done well and there are some early signs of them starting to do well and try to jump the gun. Even early for the sake of going wrong also, but sometimes it gives you a very good buying price. For example, textiles hmm. was a sector which everyone believes is a traditional sector. There's no growth. Yeah, World over yeah. is growing at whatever, 2-3%. Uh, doesn't Family have a lot of companies, so, that, this, right. that. But there is a big shift that we believe is going to happen from people which moved away from China to Bangladesh, now want to come from Bangladesh to India to outsource oh. their textile manufacturing from these regions. And an FTA with UK or a Eurozone can go a long way of benefiting Indian textile companies. And that mindset we had for a couple of years now. For the first six, eight months or year, maybe we did not get, got rewarded that much. But then now still the whole global textile economy is in doldrums. Mm -hmm. Everyone is, you know, crying that we are burdened with inventories, this, that. But Indian textile, few players, if you look at them, their balance sheets have become deleveraged, they're growing faster, mm. they are having more clients and they have a better future. Okay. So that's the kind of advantage you get if you're early. Mm. If right now I think of entering that sector, maybe some company's valuation, for example, a Gokul Das export was at 7,800 crores. I don't think I want to buy it at a billion dollars or, or four or 5,000 crores kind of a market cap. Mm. So you have to bet on companies having reasonable market cap and also having a high growth rate ahead of them. So that is where we believe small caps sometimes are undiscovered. They sometimes have higher growth rates still are undiscovered because of a lot of you can say funds not concentrating on them and hence you get and, and there's a typical example we had a stock in our portfolio called CDSL. Okay. Now CDSL is a direct play on the number of financial number of DMAT accounts DMAT that are getting opened in our country, right? But when the IPO happened, a lot of funds were not interested in CDSL because the market cap was so small. Oh. In fact, for a six to eight months, CDSL underperformed. A lot of HDFC AMCs of the world, or you know, all mm -hmm. these uh, listed AMCs that were there. Okay. But over the past three years, it has outperformed everyone, and it's now seven eight X. Uh, from its IPO level. So this is, these are ideas where you can map the growth. Post COVID, you could map the growth right. that what Zerodha is doing, what the online yeah. brokers are doing, how you could have done it, done that how yeah. DMAT accounts are getting opened and every month how CDSL was opening more accounts because it had a, mm. a better acceptance in these online, you know, brokerages and hence the penetration was benefiting CDSL more than NSDL and that's where uh, that multiple re-rating got happened and the business got re-rated and now every mutual fund or these fund houses want to want you know to buy CDSL. So there are these examples which mm. we've seen happening over and over again that bigger institutions, bigger capital always is circumspect early on, right? And that is where you want to take risk and yeah. that is where you want to identify companies which are growing well and that is where you make the most of it. It's like if someone identified Dhoni skills and you know 
gave him a advertising contract when he was just playing a ranji trophy yeah right for yeah. a 10 years then the brand that dhoni built was exceptionally well and the and the company would have done exceptionally well but after the world cup win if someone you know in 2011 thought of you know making dhoni a brand ambassador or signing a advertising then you pay that much higher amount because now he's a discovered player so even though dhoni might have done very well post that also but the kind of returns you make hmm. after something has been discovered is always less right so that's where i believe if you are young if you have this mindset that i want to first few years multiply my capital see all this financial world would tell you एक एक्सेल शीट बनाओ जिसमें आप स्टार्टिंग कैपिटल डालो उसमें आप पंद्रह टका कैगर डालो और आप पचास साल तक ये करो तीस साल इज ऑल रबिश इफ यू आर स्टार्टिंग आउट इफ यू आर स्टार्टिंग आउट योर फोकस शुड बी इफ आई कैन फर्स्ट मेक दैट कैपिटल बिग एंड दैट कैन हैपन ओनली इफ यू टेक हाई रिस्क इन अनडिस्कवर्ड बेट्स मल्टीप्लाई योर कैपिटल देन यू कैन थिंक अबाउट ऑल दिस कंपाउंडिंग वट एवर बट फर्स्ट फ्यू ईयर्स आई योर कैपिटल बिल्डिंग फेस एंड दैट शुड नॉट बी you should not be taking singles and doubles when you know you have an opportunity of hitting sixes and yeah. your risk is less right if you lose the initial matches of a world cup that's okay right i mean that's okay correct that correct. doesn't harm you much so in your initial years even if you lose a part of your capital that's okay right it's not going to ruin your end yeah. goal yeah. so the point is people try to take risk in the later part of their life it should not happen right so that's where i believe uh, one should Uh, take more risk in small caps early on and try to build the capital for sure so sir on that q uh, because you spoke about brand building what is the secret sauce that nivesha has and how do you identify stocks which are multi baggers and how how is the process like again a, a very good question and it has see it has happened over the years it was not that we started out with some approach and actually it was very accidental because of the background that i told you that i didn't have a background or that i didn't read books on investing okay so when i came to the markets because i i i i was thrilled that there is somewhere where i could experiment my entrepreneurship it was more a game of because i come from a business family uh, i didn't have investor friends or i didn't have people in the markets who were friends or i i didn't have that much inclination of reading books on markets hmm. so somewhere in my mind i didn't have a starting point hmm. so when i put a bunch of two three part timers together we were all trying to figure out how should we go about it and being from a city which is which breeds business surat and yeah. being from families that we all were from business families we thought that a easy way out is to through references try to understand few companies huh. right the smaller companies you can reach out their uh, distributors who is a good entrepreneur or you can reach out through some good business families that you know right. even some larger businesses mm-hmm. right so initially uh, uh, because i wanted to start my own business i wanted to understand businesses which were good so that i could find out a wonderful business to do myself okay. so focus was all always doing business due diligence that why a business is so good and why it has that kind of advantage that can last over the years got it so in that quest the initial approach was to meet a lot of machine manufacturers who are you know supplying the plant so for example if i met a chemical guy right in arthi industry in ahmedabad so uh, we were more focused on how a chemical plant is you know built i mean you where do you get the machinery from how much does it cost to buy yeah. land in that area so if there is a 100 crores requirement bank would fund how much kitna us pe mereko interest dena padega so it was like you know i am starting that business on my own so what should i do and how will it uh, perform the end market product ka bechna padega compete china se hum kaise karenge all these question like a businessman we st- started to answer okay. and in that quest we started adding layers hmm. that ye bhi pata karna chahiye ye bhi pata karna chahiye ye bhi dekhna chahiye ke you know aap uh, maan lo ki kisi bank se agar uh, you know you you are trying to take a take a loan what are the covenants that does it restrict uh you know a lot of uh, uh, exports or does it restrict them expanding beyond the geography because that can entail a higher risk so a lot of things as and when we uh, expanded our, uh, our our research team we added but the whole mindset initially was because of this handicap okay. that we don't understand investing 
we don't understand how stocks are identified based on financials so we went out to venture out a, a very different but a very uncanny way of identifying companies based on their business model and how the inherent business is where and then finally we all came down to the valuation because we all were chartered accountants huh. we understood huh. what accounting is we understood what finance is we understood what our numbers are but then that was our you know uh, last uh, you can say due diligence financial due diligence initially we were always doing the business due diligence and that somehow stuck over the years wow. and people who uh, you know uh, appealed to us also when they approached to join the team were people who had this ability to understand businesses rather than just having the numbers capability right so that kind of uh, you can say over the years built our approach of doing a lot of scuttle but on ground hmm. Hmm. and over the years we uh, for example in the liquor market when we try to study what uh, you know radico khetan or united spirits were doing and we found that radico khetan's uh, you know business in a way was turning around exceptionally well post the up uh, policy change for liquor post they launch international uh, you know hits like the rampur single malt and the debt going down and we then found out a lot of connects where we can actually uh, understand that how the volumes were moving oh. right and we then made that stick around so that when we found indri for example you know last year so indri single malt if we were not in uh, you can say touch with a lot of these uh, distributors of liquor we couldn't have bet on indri because the first feedback that we got that this thing was doing well was from them that is selling well oh. that a lot of people are demanding more and more because yeah. of the taste and because of the palate that it has touch and then it won, won an international award and then you know everyone is uh you know talking about indri this year but then the process that we follow made us to discover indri before when people discovered right similarly in uh, manufacturing companies right we try to get into whenever there is a a, a new product that a, a company is wanting to make or a new plant which is coming up or the entrepreneurs is trying to you know address new geography and we try to do our own due diligence got it that if mm. this company is having uh, maybe 1000 crores of sale what can take take them to 2000 3000 5000 crores of sale what margin they will make uh, whether their plant uh, machinery that they bought is from a for example the mdf industry we studied mm. in 2019 uh, when we saw a lot of players in that industry an mdf plant you can either buy from china germany wherever you want okay. to right so we try to find out the nuances that what happens or what capex is done if you buy a chinese line what capex you have to buy uh, do when you have, have to buy a german line what is the differential how much more money is required to buy a german line how much more years it will uh, you know be there uh, what are the various advantages in terms of the end product that is being made uh, so we did it across a lot of various you know businesses like uh, making quartz stones mdf uh, you can say uh, uh, tiles and a lot of these uh, glass making and we found out that there are few things which are gold standard okay. and if an entrepreneur is making those kind of decisions then there are more chances that he would be successful right and we identify those how frugal he is in terms of uh, you know trying to build up his plant how better quality product he makes what is his distribution reach is he improving that it is creating a you know good brand in mdf or not or is he relying on just selling in the open market and these things kind of stuck around in our mind that over and over again in india you have examples of these b2b kind of a businesses making brands out of themselves i mean nowhere in the world you had pipes business which like estrel has become a a brand right mm-hmm. you had an apl apollo in the metal pipes being almost 55% market share which is huge right i mean mdf plywood you look at these businesses and they are not traditionally a consumer business but in india we have had brands which have done so well because those entrepreneurs gained a lion share of volumes and then created a brand which all distributors always wanted and they have become so big so that is where we try to identify those patterns and try mm. to be early uh, and uh, try to uh, you know judge those parameters based on 
the various uh, scuttlebutt uh, approaches that we've over the years uh, developed and that's what right. sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. But we've seen at least we are able to identify things earlier than the Got market. It. So, sir, the scuttlebutt approach that you just described, I mean, small and mid-cap companies, usually the financial statements don't reflect as much value yeah. or, you know, that the information is probably less. Yeah. So, sometimes you have to attend conference calls and, yeah. you know, uh, use Idiots. that approach. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you think management quality also matters as much as the business model and everything that you described? See, the management quality, in fact, is one of the foremost thing that matters because huh. no matter how good business it is, if the quality of the management is not good, they will screw up somewhere and then as an investor, you don't have anywhere to hide. If there's a corporate governance lapse or if there is a, you know, a complete mismanagement of finances or things like that, right? So you have to understand that a lot of businesses do well because the management has keen focus on the operating uh, you can say parameters of how the cash flow would look like, how they can protect their margins, how they can over the years keep on uh, being relevant to their uh, customers and keep on increasing their customers. So that 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 fanatical mindset, that uh, you know, that fanatical mindset that you always want to you know uh, be focused in terms of not erring in your financial discipline mm. be focused on getting more market uh, be focused on maintaining your margins that is the prime important you can say okay. uh, uh, generator of long term returns so there can be companies which have good brands but over the years if they are not having good financial discipline or good management they will not be able to do so well in terms of uh, you can say stock market returns and Japan is a prime example. The entrepreneurs of Japan are one of the most disciplined entrepreneurs. They are oh. the most qualitative entrepreneurs. Their focus on quality of a product is the best. But the ROEs that Japanese companies make are one of the lowest in Asia, right? Oh. Because of their focus on quality, quality and only quality, they sometimes don't focus on the margins. Oh. And that the, uh, you know takes away the return on equity part right so you have to have people who think about the simple jo hum marwadi mein bolte na ganit mein kitna paisa kya kya paisa lagaya uspe kitna return mein kama raha hu agar aap wo 20 taka kamane ki ability apne capital pe nahi rakhte hain again and again year and year after then you will lose relevance you will lose uh, your uh, market cap returns and 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 over the years we've seen those stocks not doing well we're not able to hit that metrics so bahut zyada focus hamara wahan pe hota hai that management quality hi ye cheez discipline la sakta hai right. and that is where we focus a lot on small cap businesses because there the entrepreneur is still not a billion dollars kind of a net worth hmm. and he wants to make that hence his focus on everything the whole family has a you know very keen focus on all operating parameters because unke liye har paisa bachana zaruri hai huh. and har extra paisa kamana zaruri hai yeah. dono jagah unka focus right. hota hai when companies become large or the entrepreneurs become wealthy and they have their own family offices to run and they have a lot of income streams coming to them sometimes we feel that focus gets a bit Divide. diluted uh, again hired uh, people can be wonderful we've seen in the example in the western world where they've been exceptional managers who've done well but in india still we believe entrepreneur run entrepreneur driven companies and when they are small the kind of focus they have and the kind of you know return on equity that they generate actually creates that stock market returns and hence a management quality is actually something that we try to judge from various parameters by talking to their bankers talking to their relatives if possible oh. that how they are socially <laughs> as well talking to you know their uh, suppliers their customers their dealers whoever who can have some view on the family Got who is it. running so that we try to understand that acha ye teen log dhanda run karte hain do do ladke hain and the father is also involved father ki kya responsibility dono bachcho ki kya responsibility hai kaun zyada efficiently apna kaam karta hai kaun shayad thoda sa you know itna efficient nahi bhi hai ya kaun you know teeno mein se business ki jaan kaun hai aur kaun usko you know day in and yeah, day out yeah. improve karne ke liye improvements kar raha hai ya teeno hi utne equally good hai so we try to judge on a lot of those parameters that what the quality of the people is who is running the organization yeah. and if they will keep that 
at least for the coming 5-7 years or uh, it's good if they keep it forever but we know that post attaining some uh, you can say wealth there's always uh, uh, growth slows down your focus in a way maybe some people are so focused that it doesn't uh, go down but we don't want to take that risk, risk right and right. hence we try to identify people who will remain focused and whose quality of management is supreme and we can bet on them for the coming 5-7 years right. at least yes. so because you spoke about erosion of ROE in these Japanese companies which numbers or metrics do you particularly look at in, rather than you know just yeah. focusing on yeah. ROE any capex that yeah. you look at for yeah. small and mid cap yeah. segment yeah. Yeah. so there are various sectors which require different type of analysis right. but as I told you the crux of the matter is that we don't look at numbers first yeah. that only comes later yeah. first we try to understand what is the business's capability and how it has uh, developed a product or, or or a scale which is difficult for someone else to build hmm, hmm. and generally that should bring the other oh, things okay. in picture right okay. so a good product if it is a consumer product and if it has a good brand image then the gross margins should be very high right mm -hmm. see mm -hmm. I cannot have a 10% gross margin in, in, yeah. a, in a very uh, you know for example jockey cannot have a 10% gross margin kind of a business if it is actually doing very well mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so those kind of things we try to judge that okay. are the gross margins high if it is a consumer brand because they can only sustain if their gross margins are high yeah. right if it is a business which requires a lot of capital then are the return on equity is high right so you have various matrices for various kind of businesses but yeah our focus generally is that businesses should have industry leading margins whatever type of industry they are having they ha should have dominance in terms of their supply chain uh, they, they should be able or they have that kind of dominance that people approach them uh, uh, you know for example Tesla does very well because young engineers want to join Tesla even yeah. at a pay cut yeah. because of the aura of you know being in Tesla right mm -hmm. so you want how do you generate you know higher returns than your peers right you should have some secret mm -hmm. sauce right so that is where we try to judge whether a company is leader in its space and hence it will either have a buying advantage because it buys the raw material in bulk or it will get a lot of talent because it's a leader and people want to come there and want to you know learn a lot of things and then want to maybe you know then move out or start on their own whatever it should also have people who are good managers as we were discussing so only then they will be able to stick to the discipline and Correct. the financial matrices so there are a lot of these things that you know we try to judge but yes uh, a good return on equity is something which is non-negotiable if you're not and that is not that you already have hmm. we try to judge it eventually because a lot of businesses when they are investing the return on equities would be less because their investing phase would mean a lot of capital is being deployed but the earnings are not coming because the plant is not functional right. a lot of earnings will be back ended right so we try to judge eventually okay. will the return on equity be good and that eventuality can come either by you know the capex getting over or you can say uh, you know whatever uh, they, they they might have been making some improvements in their uh, supply chains where they are getting bulk discounts or there are some uh, arbitrage in terms of regulatory stuff that was happening for example in india there were a lot of companies which did not do well because we had an inverted duty structure in our country uh, and when that got solved that means the whole problem is going to get solved because okay. now you are importing the raw materials cheaper and uh, you know uh, your, your finished goods you can sell to the domestic market and earlier the finished goods from the international markets were coming at a cheaper price because that attracted a lesser duty so those kind of things so we are on the lookout of why some business would do exceptionally well in the coming 5-7 years or improve on its uh, matrices and we are open to uh, ideas we don't have this mindset that we will not look at a B2G business uh, we will not look at a you know business which is uh, you know just uh, 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 you know a commoditized nature even if it has a dominance and it is a lowest cost producer we will look at it maybe mm -hmm. right so we have no hindrances it's only that the financial uh, you know side of the businesses we don't uh, add much in our portfolio because uh, we generally believe that we don't understand the finance sector that well and hence uh, also that uh, we all we, we in the economy if, uh, the economy is doing well 
and that's the only time the financials do well yeah. uh, then it's better i focus on the sectors or stocks of the economy rather than buying financials so yeah that's what uh, our approach uh, has been around these uh, metrics yes so now coming to my favorite question personally uh, we are right now india is in the you know growth phase of the green energy space and yeah. you are also kind of focusing a lot on green energy could you tell us what sub segments you identified in there and where india is in this whole right. journey very interesting question again and this has played out uh, so one 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 caveat that this has played out very well over the past 2 3 years so well whether it will give such multiplier returns in the coming 5 7 years i am not sure but i'll just give you very interesting uh, thought process of how we over the past 3 years have changed our strategy around the green energy okay. and how we are now focusing on what additionally things that we could do so if you look at in indian context also uh, we had a huge solar uh, you know uh, installation boom in our country over the past you know 4 5 years right. and that came because the solar module prices crashed and generating electricity from solar energy was far cheaper than buying electricity from the grid and that's a economic you can say yeah. metric is not supported by government in any sort of manner and that in a way helped us uh, you know riding borosil renewable for example very well and we now also have a unlisted company which is bari uh, energy which we 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 you know bought uh, 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 you know uh, in the two rounds of private rounds that they had and also some stocks of these epcs for for example wari you know uh, renewable energy technologies which wari rtl which is a listed epc player in solar okay. so if you look at if the solar prices have crashed so last you know 5 6 months Uh, a lot of contracts are getting you know finalized in uh, uh, you know epc business because people are seeing the module prices crash by 40 45% mm. and the energy cost rise by 20% 25% in a lot of the states so for example in maharashtra mm. if your energy costs have gone up and your module prices have gone down so buying electricity versus last year this year is expensive Correct. but setting up a solar plant is cheaper this okay. year because the module prices have gone down okay. so it's a no brainer for companies based out of maharashtra to set up hmm. solar plant hmm. right so the epc players get benefited a lot because there'll be a lo- lot of business for them and generally their working capital cycle or other benefits happen because they are buying modules at a cheaper cost and are having projects which have you know deadlines to execute fast and in a right. solar epc is uh, you know not, not a long gestation business because everything is you know f- uh, plug and play almost because you don't have like a wind energy a lot of setup, setup that cost. needs to be done yeah. right so that's where an interesting play in the solar epc came up so every time we believe that you know things are played out there is something which emerges now for example last 4 5 months we were very bullish on the wind energy for uh, hmm. part because the wind installations in our country tank because solar was doing well okay. right and people thought that you know wind energy is completely you know done and dusted with and now there will be no uh, wind energy future in our country because you know all these players were also almost bankrupt the suzlons of the world or the inoxes of the world were facing financial difficulties a lot of these uh, global firms which came to india actually exited the business but what had happened is that a lot of states last year started realizing that in the grid if you have more solar okay the power fluctuation is higher okay. because solar typically is only during the day and you know during the monsoon month solar energy is not there yeah. and wind has a very complementary nature that yeah. during the nights wind actually blows faster and hence you have more wind energy and during monsoons the wind in india is actually at a very great speed and that produces more energy hmm. so to give stability to the grid you need a mix of solar wind and storage that's where 24 hour power can be given to the okay. grid okay. stand alone solar stand alone wind is not something which is uh, you know going to give stability to the grid so hence that is now playing out where the government is also now Uh, for the hybrid kind of projects is very open they in fact the hybrid tariffs are close to 4 rupees versus stand alone wind is just 2 rupees so if you put up a, or or solar 2 to 2 1/2 rupees hmm. so if you keep a stand alone wind or a stand alone solar it's 2 to 2 1/2 rupees the government is giving you if you put a hybrid the government sec is giving contracts for 4 rupees so oh. that's a kind of advantage the government is also giving to hybrid because it is having that kind of mindset to encourage more hybrid hmm. Hmm. hence 
the wind installation in the country which at a low of just crash to just 1 gigawatt a year right we can again go back to 6 7 gigawatts and 10 gigawatts and that in a way creates a wonderful cycle for the wind energy because so many people went out of the business for the past 7 8 years right. because they could not sustain this downturn mm. now there were fewer players who have larger business and there is a repowering also that is an opportunity because all the wind farms that were made in this country or that came up in this country were having shorter heights and now we have wind turbines which are at 130 meter height and 140 meter height these are larger turbines can generate more electricity so it makes sense hmm. for people who had these older turbines to graduate to you know uh, newer turbines so right. that's an interesting opportunity that is getting developed then storage will throw up a lot of opportunity as i told you because now you will also need storing storage. right so and we were talking about green hydrogen right hmm. so hmm. there are a lot of ways to play the green energy theme because i feel that will dominate the way we produce and consume energy both on both ends right because right. you need uh, for example if you take that if there was the earlier system of centralized manufacturing of power where a thermal power would be put up in you know a, 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 a city or, or, or in some place and there will be transportation of power from that place to all of that state for example hmm. versus that model now we will have a model where there is distributed generation of power everywhere right? right and you need more touch points of collection and distribution of power hence you need more transformers hmm. you need more substation right. you need more re equipment for that so these are the kind of opportunity you need more transmission towers you need more transformers so that is where we believe the whole grid needs a revamp not just in india but globally, globally. because it was a one way grid and now we want an interactive grid and that is where a lot of investment needs to happen over the coming you know decade and that's where a lot of interesting opportunities are still there have played out still uh, available and we are focusing on those opportunities for example and sir, what about the EV segment and the fuel cell technology that is coming up? The government is also, I think they've come out with a PLI scheme. Yeah. So all these things, do they play out well in yeah. this sector also? Again, that's again a dominant theme globally where electric vehicles, we were talking about that being the future and in our context also, uh, we have companies, surprisingly, which are world leaders in certain components that goes into EV, right? right? right. So like sun, shunt resistors and now there are, uh, you know, a lot of people talking about uh, uh, Tesla trying to set up a plant in India and a lot of ancillaries around would be supplied by Indian companies. So again, interesting opportunities in that space. So what I'm hmm. trying to tell you is that is how energy would be consumed by automobiles, right? right. Going forward, right. it will not right. consume fossil fuels. It will consume either hydrogen or, you know, electricity, yeah. whatever. And that will throw up a lot of opportunity because a lot of the cycle of ancillaries would change. Mm -hmm. How they are getting built, what kind of components that way they will have. And that also throws up a lot of interesting opportunity in the engineering space, in the uh, auto component space. And that's where, uh, again, uh, is a hunting ground for high growth kind of companies which can come up for sure. Right. So, sir, one question from the macroeconomic perspective. Right now, we are probably just uh, getting 2 or 3 percent of, you know, the GDP value through these, uh, you know, shunt resistors and all these things that you spoke about. We're adding just 2, 3 percent of the value. So, how does this play out in the future? Do you, do you think we will, you know, move forward of China in terms of all these uh, components? And what is your take on that? Yeah, very interesting question. And please understand that whenever a dominating trend has started it has always started small, small. so i don't know whether you know uh, there's a very interesting video by tony siba that he explains that all these technologies whether it be uh, you know uh, uh, people riding horses and when the first time they uh, explored that you can buy a, a car or an automobile can transport you from a place to other and that dominated the world in lesser number of years than people earlier imagined right okay. so be it any technology it has started out very small and then there's a blowout phase and the adoption goes through the sky eventually. So I am a firm believer that a lot of these technologies that we are talking about, be it AI, be it EV, be it, uh, you know, green energy or you can say how we, uh, you know, consume a lot of things in, 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 our, in our world is going a sea change in the coming 20. I mean, just think about it. When was 
that the last time that you saw a world which was changing so much yeah. right it was hmm. we had an automobile invention we had maybe invention for the telephone and you know, all you know uh, things of the past we did not have so many things happening at the same hmm. time hmm. in the global economy and still people around the world are bearish we thinking that there's a recession in the us there's a problem in hamas yeah. there's this that you just think about how conducive the world is right now in terms of technologies which are completely going to change how we run our automobiles completely going to change how we consume our electricity completely going to change how we perform our activities because there'll be ai run and how medical uh, would change dramatically how a lot how our food would change dramatically in the coming 20 30 years mm. and you will feel that this is something which you know we'll then repent after a few years that why we did not think about it but i feel there's there's a big change and there's a simultaneous change happening and tony siva again in that video covers that and in a very beautifully explained mm. uh, manner that change happens when there are multitude of things happening to, together simultaneous technologies coming together right okay. uber didn't become uber because it had a great app hmm. uber became uber because there was a 5g network that was rolled around the world people bought smartphones which both the technologies were not made by uber hmm. these were independent technologies developing elsewhere and they converged and uber had a service offering which took off okay. because of that right so you have to have convergences and i believe there are a lot of convergences that are happening in the coming decade or two decades and that is where if someone is at a lookout you can have you know that kind of again experiences of uh, a higher returns if you are proven right and those convergences do play out okay interesting sir could you tell us like briefly what the new small case is about the consumer small case that you just launched yeah. so again this this small case focuses on the consumer in india which wants to premiumize okay. if you look at our economy post covid what we've seen is there's a sea change of how a consumer thinks how he consumes everyone wants better products luxury Uh, uh products and they are consuming and wanting it in india itself so for mm. example luxury watches as a trend the trend in india was you go on a foreign trip and generally people buy a watch from abroad mm. right Correct. but covid meant that they could not travel mm. and covid also meant that people thought yaar paise ka kya karenge itna paisa pada hai paisa to koi utility nahi yeah. hai people thought where should i so, so there's this whole Uh, you know mad you can say uh, uh buying of premium liquor premium watches and that was not a phenomena in india it was world around i think and it you had it's called revenge shopping revenge shopping right? but yeah. and that has continued if hmm. you look at there are stockouts even now okay. in brands like rolexes in uh, higher brands like an odema spigate or i don't know how to spell it but the point is that these are uh brands which we uh, you know believe uh, or these are businesses which we believe are you know having an aspirational value and the indian consumer has now you know opened up to it Got they it. don't mind spending you know a 10000 rupees for yeah. a shirt yeah. which they used to mind hmm. for example you know buying a calvin klein jeans which cost maybe 10000 bucks was not in their minds earlier but now they want because when they want to go out or they are uploading a photograph or their on instagram they want to display their brand or display their watch or all these things so we believe these aspirational brands and and if if you think about it in india the family system today also is that the finances are still you know joint right okay. generally okay. the families yeah. might have split but the finances are joined and uh, generally what has happened is that the first generation or the second generation has earned the money they have planned for the physical resources and everything and now the new generation hmm. doesn't want to buy a large sprawling house because they already have one doesn't want to buy a a good office because they already have Got the it. physical asset needs have been done yeah. the new generation wants to travel abroad they want to go shopping they want to buy experiences they want to buy a lot of these uh you can say a dis uh, uh, uh discretionary kind of consumer mm, things mm, mm. 
and that is where we believe traveling uh, if you think about it you have a dominant player in our country like an indigo airlines available at a valuation we believe is 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 you know extremely lucrative or brands of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, owners of uh, global brands which are uh, franchise owners over here available at a reasonable valuation either in the retailing side of the business or brand manufacturing kind of a business uh, and and you have for example a company which makes bags for you know these global brands and those licensing contracts are with oh. that company and hence the, uh, that company should do extremely well i believe okay. in the coming you know 5 7 years uh, 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 a watch retailing company is the only a pan india watch retailing company which is growing pretty fast is launching new brands in india is now also going to adjacencies right mm-hmm. for example uh, ethos now also has launched remova is a luxury luggage yeah. wear and if you look at remova uh, you can say uh, 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 stores abroad they are uh, huge in terms of the aspirational value that they have and these adjacencies can bring a lot of revenues in the coming years is what the ability of the ethos management has because they have relationship with these brands like the lvmh groups of the world and they can you know brand yeah. by brand bring a lot of those things to india so right. i believe businesses which are focusing on these kind of discretionary a uh, consumption can do really well and hence we've launched this small case which is kind of around these plays great sir all the best for this Thank sounds you. really so good so uh now just to end it on a lighter note i'll ask you a rapid fire round you yeah. have to be really quick yeah so how old were you when you first made your investment 16 years okay which was the stock that you bought and why first stock i bought was i guess uh, arti industries okay and why because just a tip which my friend gave oh. <laughs> <laughs> you start start out like that yeah. usually investing in india or the us which one would you always prefer always india always. there is no better country to see, see buffett did well because he had this mad you can say bullishness about the us economy i guess indian young indians would do extremely good if they are madly bullish about our economy and invest in our country i feel business story or financial numbers what is more important business story more me good business with high valuations or not so great business with dirt cheap valuations see i think you can do better of the both the worlds you can have good businesses at a reasonable valuation markets in in the small cap side uh, you know gives us that at luxury at least till now okay. going forward when the participation in the indian economy goes up we believe our our advantage would go away because a lot of smart people like you now are into research and they are uh, understanding businesses day in and day out so it is becoming difficult to find good businesses at a reasonable Cheap valuation value. but always focus should be at good valuation rather than buying uh, crappy businesses for yeah. sure yeah one piece of advice you would give to your younger self not to trade i lost a lot of money trading and doing <laughs> okay. uh, a lot of trading activity so if i could have saved that, but i i don't think i would have learned my lessons if i don't do, didn't do that yeah. but yeah that is something i would have one investing mistake you would never like to repeat i almost blew up my capital doing this trading in fno so i will not want to do that again again trading yeah, right yeah, okay yeah. if you could have dinner with one famous investor baby dead or alive who would it be rakesh junjunwal i would have loved oh. if i would have had a dinner with him for 4 5 hours it would have been the uh, the best Lovely. you can say day of my life bull or bear market which one do you find more interesting i enjoy both the markets because bear markets but yeah the high of the bull markets always gives you better spirits so yeah, yeah it is it is more lively and hence <laughs> gives you better uh, feeling a, a, at least then a bear market. Uh, and you bear market give you better prices yeah one favorite movie on stock markets the big shot one favorite book on stock market investing one up on wall street oh in one word how would you describe the feeling of spotting a multi bagger yeah it is sometimes uh, not uh, visible to you when you identify it because you don't know what's going to happen hmm. but yeah there have been four or five occasions in my life where i have you know been extremely happy owning a company because i found an amazing entrepreneur and his energy uh, is something that i found uh, you know matches uh, 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 some multi bagger that i have i've observed uh, earlier so i was very confident and i bet on them better heavily and it it turned out to be well and i was almost certain when i identified them so that experience i have only had three or four times in my life okay. i want to increase those experiences <laughs> but yeah 
it was very enjoying for sure when yeah. when when i did that yes so so that's the end of the podcast i personally uh, learned a lot from this one and thank you so much again for doing it thank you so much for inviting me and you had such good questions thank you so much thank you thank you